Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the fourth School of Law Pankhurst Lecture. We are here today to celebrate an inspiring woman, Christabel Pankhurst, and to do so we have the help of another inspiring woman, Dame Anne Owers. I think it's worth remembering how relatively recently, certainly for people of my generation, things have changed for women in the public space. My own mother was seven years old before her mother, my grandmother, was able to vote in 1928, since in 1918 she was A, under 30, and B, not a ratepayer or property owner. And I was born in the aftermath of the other great war of the 20th century, into a very different dawn, free education, health care, sense of expectation, possibility. Yet there were still barriers and challenges. My mother, like other married women, including teachers, was expected to give up work when she married so as not to compete with men. And in the year that I sat the so-called scholarship exam to go to grammar school and was vaguely thinking, very vaguely, about what might open up for me, the House of Lords debated the vexed question of whether women should be allowed to be life peers, having had the vote for nearly 40 years. And I, there's, there's a speech there, which I just wanted to quote bits of you, from Earl Ferrers, who was only 28 and a hereditary peer, but had some very clear ideas on the subject of women in public life. He began by saying, frankly, I find women in politics highly distasteful. In general, they're organizing, they're pushing, and they're commanding. I disagree with those who say that women in your lordship's house would cheer up our benches. If one looks at a cross-section of women already in parliament, I do not feel that one could say they're an exciting example of the attractiveness of the opposite sex. I believe there are certain duties and certain responsibilities which nature and custom have decreed men are more fitted to take on. It is generally accepted that the man should bear the major responsibility in life. It's generally accepted, for better or worse, that a man's judgment is generally more logical and less tempestuous than that of a woman. If we allow women into this house, where will this emancipation end? Shall we, in a few years' time, be referring to the noble and learned lady, the Lady Chancellor? I find that a horrifying thought. But why should we not? Should we follow the rather vulgar example set by the Americans of having female ambassadors? Will our judges, for whom we have so rich and well-deserved respect, be drawn from the serried ranks of the ladies? If that is so, I would offer to the most reverend primate, the Archbishop of Canterbury, the humble and respectful advice he'd better take care lest he might find himself out of a job. These examples may sound a little excessive, but I fail to see any reason whatever why if one allows women to become peers, this form of emancipation should not extend into those other positions of trust and responsibility which in the past have been carried out and to such good effect by men. He ended by saying, um, I want to end by saying, we like women, we admire them, Sometimes we even grow fond of them, but we do not like them here. And that, as I say, is very much within my, within my own lifetime. Those views, even by then, were not the norm, and thankfully Earl Ferrers lost the vote. But they show how far things have moved in the last half century. Not only have we had women peers, but, shock horror, two ladies as prime ministers, not only are there women judges, but one of them, your previous speaker, holds the highest judicial office in the country and is, I think, a fantastic role model for other women because she's not only reached where she has herself, but has also been really active in trying to encourage other women, not, not pulling up the ladder, but trying to provide escalators through the glass ceiling. And, and also for equality more generally. Clergymen may have trembled, but the earth didn't erupt when the first female Bishop of London was consecrated and gave a whole different feel to the last Remembrance Day service. And the three most important roles in policing at the moment, three of the most important roles in policing, the Commissioner of the Metropolitan Police, the Head of the National Crime Agency, and the Head of the National Police Chiefs Council are all, at this moment, women. And as I go around prisons now, the very noticeable thing is the number of women governors of large and difficult prisons, not just prisons for women or prisons for children, sometimes sent in to sort out prisons in difficulty. So there have been changes, but there are still challenges. I don't know whether any of you read Mary Beard's book about women and power, reflecting on how the voice of women is perceived and how women in leadership roles can be subject to public attack and some very serious trolling and even ridicule in a way that's not the case for men. I often reflect on the use of the word formidable. 
When it's used about a man, it means someone who is, you know, a captain of industry, someone to be reckoned with. When it's used about a woman, you, you, women, you kind of get a picture of a sort of matron figure, who is, um, uh, who is, 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 whose leadership you you are really rather worried about. Uh, as, as has been said, I'm really proud to have been the first woman chief inspector of prison and the first woman head of the police complaints body. But I'll be much less pleased to have been the only woman in those roles, which is up to now the case. I just wanted to say a little bit about my own route to where I've come to, because many of you, men and women, will be looking at what you do next. And I know that this is now a much more difficult career path than it was when graduates, men and women, were a much rarer breed. For some of you, there'll be an obvious choice, a route to a career in the law, either practicing or academic, and as Brenda Hale has shown, they're not mutually exclusive. But for many others, it will be less straightforward, as it was for Christabel, unable to practice law even though she was an outstanding student. I'm more on the Christabel side in terms of experience. My degree is in history, and it certainly doesn't seem obvious that that would be a career path that would lead to inspecting prisons or investigating the police. And my route there was much more of a meander. I did a lot of voluntary work in South London at a local advice center in race relations work. And that meant giving advice and help from anything from benefits to immigration to arrests. It was the time of the Brixton riots, and it was also the time of the changes to British nationality law, which profoundly affected my neighbors who'd come to the UK from the Caribbean on British passports and were told that they were no longer British. Echoes there of the recent Windrush issues. I learned a great deal about the lives and experiences of people who found themselves on the other side of systems and processes that they felt they couldn't control or understand, and which certainly didn't understand them or empower them and allow them to flourish. Not just immigration and policing, but local authorities, benefits, housing, big systems that profoundly affect the daily lives of people. And systems that often patronize them rather than playing to their strengths, and which could also act to marginalize or exclude them. And that led to, work, to paid work in two voluntary sector organizations, the Joint Council for the Welfare of Immigrants, which provided advice and campaigned on issues of immigration, nationality, and asylum, and Justice, the legal human rights organization that was one of those that successfully argued for the incorporation of human rights law into the UK. Uh, and I learned there how to deal with some very eminent lawyers. I am not a lawyer, and um, uh, I've never pretended to be one, but I learned a lot. From, from that organization. And, and we also help train statutory and voluntary organizations in, in human rights. Um, and I, so I learned a, de a great deal about aspects of the law, but I also learned a great deal about listening to service users, about looking around and not just up. Uh, and one of my roles until recently um, has been chairing um, an organization called CLINCS, which is the organization, which is the umbrella organization for voluntary sector groups dealing with people in, in the criminal justice system. Um, and that is very much um, a service user-led um, experience. And that's what the voluntary sector should, is, is, is good at doing and can offer to the rest of the system. So eventually, and by a circuitous route, I got to be Chief Inspector of prison, Prisons and, and then to the Independent Police Complaints Commission, and now to chairing the Independent Monitoring Boards, which are the groups of volunteers. They're unpaid, but they're public appointees, and they have the right to go into their local prison or immigration removal center um, and monitor what goes on there, have access to all the documents, all the prisoners and detainees, and make reports, and they're a very important part of accountability, as I'll go on to say. They're, they're all very different roles, but they're all united by one thing, and that is independent oversight of the organizations of the state that exercise the most coercive powers available in a democratic society. We give them those coercive powers for a reason, um, but it's, it's also important that there is accountability for use of those powers, and those organizations are a very important part of accountability. But they also all required the collection and analysis of evidence. Because even though those organizations are statutory, they have no hard power. They can't force anybody to do anything. The only power you have is soft power. And your influence entirely depends on the strength, relevance, and cogency of your evidence and analysis. 
And when I met my old supervisor at university some time later, when I, was being, when I was chief inspector of prisons, I think I rather surprised her when I said I had never used my history degree to such great effect than when I was inspecting prisons, because it had taught me how to gather evidence, how to collect it, how to test it, how to analyze it. And those skills were very important in pulling together all the different things that happen in a prison. I want to reflect a bit on those different kinds of oversight and their complementarity. Um, and why, why, why are there so many organizations, and, and services sometimes complain about this, exercising power in this way, exercising oversight, rather, in this way? As I said, there, there are organizations that have, rightly, significant coercive power. Imprisonment, the most severe punishment that can be imposed. And that's not just the lack of liberty, but that it takes place out of sight and often out of mind of the public, behind high walls. And the power is always with those who are running the system. What and whether you eat, whether you get out of your cell, what you wear, what you do. But the public needs to know and to accept what goes on there. And similarly, policing. The police have a range of coercive powers, arrest, detention, forcible entry and search, deploying a range of lethal and non-lethal weapons, but within a tradition of policing by consent, which requires public trust and confidence, especially in certain communities and at certain times. So those powers are needed. But that, like all power, they are open to abuse. But in this country, more uh, re abuse being, is relatively rare, more often what you will find is its close relative institutional convenience. All institutions tend to develop a default setting of institutional convenience and sometimes institutional protection, developing internally focused values and practices, confusing guarding reputation with hiding your head in the sand. Look, look around, this is not by no means exclusive to police and prisons. Look at things like non-disclosure agreements within organizations, including charities. Look at child abuse in religious settings. But closed institutions, out of public gaze, are particularly susceptible. Prisons and policing also face some specific risks and challenges. The majority of the people they interact with or use their power over are both challenging and vulnerable often living on the margins of society, outsiders before they were literally inside. They're not the most popular or the most well-connected citizens. Both services are right to point out that they face risks and deal with situations and people that most of us avoid. They need to develop corporate loyalty and trust. You need to know that someone will stand by you in situations of threat. This can, though, slide into a defensive or even collusive culture against the rest of the world who just don't know what it's like out there. So independent scrutiny and oversight is an important part of accountability for the use of those powers. And it takes a number of forms. At the highest level, you've got courts and inquests and the sanctions there. That can provide basic safeguards, but the threshold is rightly very high, and access can be very difficult, not only because legal aid is limited, but because of the short-term nature of many individuals' contact with police and prisons, and they need evidence, um, and, and so it's, it's rightly a high test. The next level is what I was doing at the IPCC, now renamed the Independent Office of Police Conduct, when some independent investigation, when something has or might have gone wrong. And that's why the IPCC had indep has independent oversight of the police complaint system and must investigate serious allegations, for example, corruption and deaths that follow police contact. The Prisons and Probation Ombudsman plays a similar role in relation to deaths and complaints in prisons, though she doesn't have the powers of a, the powers of a constable, for example, that the IPCC does. By definition, the, or the IOPC now, by definition, this is a reactive role when something has or is alleged to have gone wrong. But both organizations have invested a lot in trying to ensure that institutions learn from those, from those incidents. And I'll talk more about that. And then there's inspection and monitoring. Inspection happens occasionally, carried out by paid staff with professional educators and healthcare professionals, focusing down on an establishment at a specific time prisons, immigration detention, military detention also in my time. Monitoring is carried out by, as I said, by locally recruited citizen volunteers, and they're there every week, usually more than once, and they're a crucial link to their local community. And both of them 
op op operate in a complementary fashion. Both of them are essentially preventive. They're meant to prevent abuse and inhuman or unfair treatment rather than to chronicle it. And that's why they are part of the UK's national preventive mechanism, which is required by the UN, um, a, 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 the UN protocol against torture. Um, so there's an international as well as a national basis, a national statutory basis, but an international human rights basis. So why do we do it? During my time at the Prisons Inspectorate, I identified something I called a virtual prison. And that was the one that ran in the governor's office. And it was pretty good. Whereas the actual prison on the landings and in the cells could be significantly less good. In well-run prisons, the two were close, but they were never quite identical. And the reason for the virtual prison was usually the existence of what I used to call a charcoal filter, which removed all the impurities the higher up the organization information went because everybody wanted to give good news to the person who was their immediate superior. And it went all the way sometimes up to the minister's red box because everyone, as I say, at every level wanted to report what was good and successful rather than what was not working. And I'm sure that equally in, in the police, there are virtual police custody suites and command areas with just as effective a filter. It's also important to provide an external reference point to ask why as well as how. Institutions can get accustomed to environments and ways of doing things. And that's why for monitoring bodies, it's vital to be there. Whether that's an occasional in-depth in inspection or a regular IMB presence, you can't test these environments on paper or rely on action plans that might be sitting inactive in filing cabinets. And that's one of the things that the Care Quality Commission found when it started trying to, to, uh, trying to inspect social care on paper. And some of you may remember the awful things that were, that were revealed to be happening in a, in, a, in a care home called Winterbourne View because no one had actually been there to find out. And the retiring um, person for, who, before the Care Quality Commission was set up, who had been doing that work before and had routinely gone into places, um, I remember her giving the memorable phrase that you have to get in there and smell the urine. Sometimes inspection doesn't result in change, but it's nevertheless important to keep saying it when you find things that are simply not right. For example, I don't know any other public or indeed private building where it would be thought acceptable for two men to sleep, eat, and defecate in the same small space, sometimes one needing to sit on the unscreened toilet to eat. It would be closed down for health and safety, safety grounds. It happens routinely in our prisons. It's not possible to sort that out straight away. No one running prisons wants that to be the case. But if we stop saying it's wrong, then what's normal will become normative. There is a downside to inspection and monitoring, which those working in police and prisons will be very aware of, which, which is because there is more independent oversight, the paradoxical result can be that there is less trust in the organizations because more is known about the things that are going wrong. I have absolutely no doubt that the police service in England and Wales is a great deal better and a great deal more accountable than it was when I was working in South London and Brixton in the 1970s. But we know more about it, and, and paradoxically, we trust it prob probably less than people trusted the police in, in those days. So I think we have to be careful to try, and, and it's very difficult, because obviously bad messages make news, and we have to be very careful about the messages we give out and how we give it. But in the end, what can it achieve? And what have I learned about all of this? The soft power that you have as one of these external oversight bodies is crucially dependent on being part of what I would call a virtuous circle. Not just saying what's wrong, but trying to put it right. Drawing together the findings and insights of the different oversight bodies but also, crucially, those responsible for running prisons and the police. And that includes ministers and government. That's the only way it will make a difference and not just be voyeurism. Let me give you a few examples of what's worked and what's not worked. In policing, between the time the IPCC was set up and 2018, when it morphed into the IOPC, deaths in police custody more than halved. And that wasn't just because the IPCC investigated those deaths, it also published the findings and the police service bought into the need to use the findings from the new, more intrusive, more public investigations 
and developed national safer detention custody guidelines and practice. The fact that at the time I left, 15 people died, mainly from natural causes in police custody, given that over three quarters of a million people were arrested, says a lot for the focus on safety, though there remain concerns about what happened next once people were released, and also some concern about, about risk aversion in police, police, in police custody. But nevertheless, it was, it was a story that was the result of work between the monitoring body and the police service itself. When I started at the IPCC, the police didn't routinely collect, collect and analyze use of force statistics. So there was no way of analyzing whether a force appeared to be overused, was unsafe, or whether certain officers or certain kinds or ethnicities of people were overrepresented. They are now, and hopefully that analysis will help people to spot things before they, anything goes disastrously wrong. There is still some resistance to challenge and oversight. And one of the things that the IOPC, the successor body to the IPCC, is still, is still asking for is for, is, is for um, a requirement for, um, for, for, for a, duty of, a duty of candor or a duty, a duty to, to cooperate actively with investigations, because otherwise they can take too long. There's also, I think, I, I'm sure it's true within most organizations, but as I was dealing with police, I'll, I'll mention police, the response to complaints. Overall, I think the police still treat complaints as a criticism, not an opportunity for improvement. Um, I, when, when police and crime commissioners were first created, one of them said, my job is to get down the number of complaints. And you thought, no, actually, because they are, they are valuable management information. You don't want to prevent people from complaining. If you're running a business, your complaints will start telling you what's starting to go wrong before it goes seriously wrong. They are, in a sense, the canary in the mine. And that didn't happen, for example, in Rochdale and in Huddersfield, when, there were co when complaints about widespread child sexual abuse were ignored, largely because of where they came from, challenging and difficult young people who were also, by definition, highly vulnerable to exploitation. People failed to see through the complainant to the complaint. But I think a more, se a more serious question is what accountability means. And for me, it doesn't stop or mean, essentially, individual blame and responsibility, though that's important, but organizational responsibility and learning. The police, com the police complaint system has been constructed very much on the level of blame as an entry point to being disciplined, not an opportunity for resolution or learning. And sometimes this can mean, in my experience, I found it can mean that actually the person who was holding the parcel when the music stopped is the person on whom all the focus is without thinking how come, what was in that parcel and how come the music did stop and what was going on before that happened. And I think one of the things I was most pleased we were able to do when I was at the IPCC was a report called Six Missed Chances, which looked at the tragic death of a young man in mental health crisis and pointed out the point at which a number of organizations, not just the police, but including the police, could have done something differently which might have had a different outcome. And that kind of learning is really important to get to. If I turn to prisons, the Complementary work of inspection, monitoring, and investigation has produced results in the past. For example, between 2002 and 2010, the incidence of self-inflicted deaths in prisons halved. The, the ombudsman began to inspect, investigate them. Inspection and monitoring reports pointed out systemic flaws in procedures, which were then changed and strengthened. An inspection report on the appalling standard of health care in prisons around the turn of the century resulted in the NHS taking over, which made better clinical governance, better connection to the outside. And inspection reports changed the way young people were detained and led to a considerable drop in the detention of children. The combination of occasional professionally led inspection, local and continual IMB presence is very, is very powerful. And for IMBs, it's not just a question of the big stuff, though that's important. It's also the little stuff. Don't underestimate the importance of small things in controlled environments. Whether you, whether you get out, whether you've got clean clothing, um, where, whether you're able to phone your family, whether your mail's coming. 
In general, in my time as Chief Inspector of Prisons, prisons improved. Two thirds of our recommendations were achieved. There was better education, better health care, more focus on resettlement and rehabilitation. But in my last, in my valedictory lecture, I did sound a warning that the population was increasing while resources were decreasing. Staff were taken out. Go prison governors were told to aim for the bronze standard, not the gold standard. Problem is, if you aim for the bronze standard and miss, um, you get something that is um, not exactly what you should be aiming for. So between 2010 and 2016, 30% of prison staff were taken out of prisons, while the prison population didn't, as promised, decrease. In fact, it kept on increasing. Suicides rocketed up again. Prisons became much less safe and decent places. That didn't mean the inspectorate, the IMBs, or the ombudsman were doing less good jobs. In fact, they were taken more notice of, probably. But it did reflect the cuts in prison staff, and the previous focus on self-harm was diluted. Eight years later, going back into prisons, I see a noticeable and apparent deterioration in safety, activity, and the chance of rehabilitation. And as I said, that's not because accountability mechanisms are weaker. It's because prisons obey a law of gravity. They are not, they are not inherently safe places. They depend on consent and relationships. And they go down much more quickly than they come up. And I think because we'd had safe and decent prisons for decades, ministers and some in the prison service underestimated the work it had taken to get there. So the toxic combination of more prisoners, fewer staff, and new psychoactive substances reached crisis point before anything was done. And there were no quick fixes. Once you lose control and you lose experienced staff, new and inexperienced staff struggle, and others have learned to back off. There are promises of change now, and that's, that's welcome. There are new staff in, there are promises of of, 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 of things happening, more activity, more engagement with prisoners. Feels to me, in many ways, very much like back to the future, because these are things I used to take for granted when I was going around prisons um, in, the, um, in the early 2000s. So we're...